And this morning comes from 2 Kings chapter 4. If you would, please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, but the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what have you in the house? And she said, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels and not too few. Then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons and pour into all the vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So she went from him and shut the door behind herself and her sons and she poured, uh, and as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. And when the vessels were full, she said to her, her son, bring me another. And he said to her, there is not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God and he said, go, sell the oil and pay your debts and you and your sons can live on the rest. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, this amazing story. We thank you for your provision for this widow and, and her sons. We thank you for miracles and the work of Elisha, for the way you minister to your people. We ask that you would minister to us even now, that you would speak through your Holy Spirit to our hearts and to our minds, that we would be ready to hear, that we might be transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ask these things in his name. Amen. You may be seated. Nineteen thirty nine, the grapes of wrath came out, one of John Steinbeck's best known novels. Tells the story of a family uh, by the name of Jode. They lived in Depression era Oklahoma. They were unable to pay their debts and the family farm was foreclosed on by the bank and kicked off their land. They end up moving to California to seek work in the fruit orchards there. While the story itself is fictional, the basic scenario of it was anything but. It's estimated that between 1930 and 1935, some 750,000 farms were lost to bankruptcy and foreclosure. Problems all grew out of overexpansion of farming during the 20s that caused a devaluation of the land and of the crops they grew, as well as the dust bowl and drought scenario that engulfed much of the Midwest in the 30s. As people lost their land and their livelihood, their homes, they were caught in a spiral of ever worsening vulnerability as the system failed them and as opportunists preyed upon them. It was a brutal period. Farmers have always been vulnerable to the whims of the weather. And this is particularly so, even more so, in ancient Israel, a land with fairly limited water resources to begin with. It could go from bad to worse just by missing only one rainy season. Today we're looking at a story in which Elisha performs a miracle in order to help a family that was caught by the problems of a broken world and broken systems that exposed their vulnerability and put their very lives at risk. Though most of us are not farmers, I bet we've experienced similar types of exposure in various ways in this life. So let's see what we can learn. Now the story begins with the wife of one of the members of this sort of prophetic school or society that was present in, in Israel. We, you know, we learned earlier during the period of Elijah that there were a couple of these. Um, and this woman approaches Elisha with her problem. Her husband has died. Now being a widow in an ancient world, especially ancient Near East, was a very rip- uh, risky proposition at best. 
unless you happened to be extremely wealthy. Because women really didn't have an opportunity for any sort of honorable employment available to them. But this woman has two sons, and that really ought to leave her in a reasonably well-provided situation, right? It'd be better to have more sons, but sons can work. They can provide. However, her husband, and, and both of these people are anonymous. We don't know who they were. There's a Jewish tradition that says that this was Obadiah, who was the, right, the head uh, steward of Ahab that we, we read about earlier, clearly one of the members. We don't know if it was him or not. But whoever they are, he left her with another problem. That problem was debt. So if you had a, a lean year as a farmer in the ancient world, you'd take out a loan to buy seed to plant uh, for the next year, for the next crop. Then if the crop comes in fine, right, you reap your harvest and you use some of the profits to pay off your creditor and you're good. But if there's another drought, then you have a problem because there's nothing to pay the creditor with. Now, Israel had a system in place to deal with this situation. Uh, and that system was meant to provide both, well, to, to protect both sides of the equation, right? If creditors aren't protected and ha don't have a recourse, then they're never going to loan any money out, which puts everybody in a bind. But at the same time, you want to protect the people that are made vulnerable by the whims of the weather. The system is spelled out in Leviticus 25. It's also other details are in Exodus and other places. But basically, if a fellow Israelite becomes destitute in their situation, you should loan him money without charging interest to him. But if things get real bad and he still cannot pay you back, then he could sell himself to you uh, in order to work off the debt, right? It's sort of like showing up to a restaurant, you can't pay the bill, you end up washing dishes for a little while or something to pay for your food. Now, this isn't slavery in the sense that we think of slavery, it's sort of the old South chattel slavery. Uh, this was sort of an indentured, indentured servanthood, if you will, um, where you would work for, the, for your creditor as, until you could pay off the debt or until a year of Jubilee came along uh, and then you would be freed, you could go back home. That said, if you couldn't pay off your debt, this wasn't exactly a voluntary situation either. So in this dire situation, if her husband had been alive, he might have been indentured to his creditor, but her sons would have been left to her to work the farm with her. And if they could have a good crop, they could pay off his debt and he'd be back. But since he was dead, the creditor was going to take his two sons and they're probably pretty young, in his place. This leaves the widow with a farm to work, but no money, right? She can't hire any laborers, and she doesn't have the physical ability to do it all by herself. So suddenly, she is now in danger of losing her sons, her home, her farm, and perhaps even her life, right? If things get worse. She could end up a beggar. She could end up having to do something dishonorable. It could get really, really bad. And so the system that was meant to protect has now made her vulnerable. And it's not just the system, right? Because in her position, she could be exploited by just about anyone. Now, we don't know the creditor's situation. Nothing is said anything about that. He could be a, a rich fat cat that's just looking to take advantage of her demise. Or perhaps, right, the drought has left him just as desperate as she is. He may be overextended and needing her sons just so he can work his farm and pay his bills. We just don't know. But regardless, a combination of death and weather and debt have put this woman and her sons in a very, very bad position. She's in a hole, if you will, and there's, there's no way out that she can see. In fact, it, it seems like the only thing it can do is get deeper and get worse. How has the brokenness of this world caught you out before? Right? When and where have you felt vulnerable and insecure and unable to do anything about it? We're in the season of 
Lent right now. It's a time of penitence. It's a time often of fasting. Part of the point of that fasting is to be reminded of our dependence upon God, of our vulnerability, to remember the brokenness of our world even when we're insulated from it by our wealth and our possessions. You know, none of us in our culture likes to ask for help. We have a real, right, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps type of mentality. But that's not always possible. When were you facing bills that you weren't sure how to pay? Perhaps behind on your rent or your car payments. Perhaps you you lost a job unexpectedly. Did you have family available to help you? Or were you estranged from them or perhaps they were in a worse state than you were? Was your vulnerability manifested in some medical condition, right? That doctors were struggling to deal with and help you deal with. Maybe the unfixable problems in your life had more to do with relationships that had become toxic and put you in an awkward position or perhaps it was due to mental health issues, struggling with anxiety or depression, right? What do you fear the most? What, what triggers you, if you will? Where will your help come from in those moments? So this woman goes to Elisha with her problem. Now, Elisha is not at least formally a kinsman redeemer for her. This was another system of protection that was in place uh, in the law in Israel, right? And, And that said that a relative should step in and help the widow in her time of need. Elisha is not that, however, he is the leader of the school of prophets that her husband was a part of. And it's worth pointing out that at this point in the history of Israel, it's a mostly pagan place, right? To be really a follower of the Lord, to be in part of this school of prophets would put her in a very small minority. And so probably the trustworthy uh, resources that she had available to her, sources of help, would be very limited. So she goes reminding Elisha of her husband's faithfulness to the Lord. And she's kind of leveraging that, right? Putting a sense of obligation, if you will, on Elisha to have compassion and to do something about this. Now, it's probably worth also pointing out that if you remember, when Elisha was first called by Elijah, he himself was a farmer. And it's likely that he would have a lot of sympathy for her situation. Regardless of all that, he is amenable to helping her, but it's not like he's got the cash on hand to just pay off her debt. So, well, how can I help? Let's see, what do you have, he says. She says, I got nothing but this little jar of oil. That's not gonna do any good. He says, okay, I can work with that. Go to your neighbors. Borrow every empty jar pot, container, anything that you can find from every single one of them. Get a lot. Don't don't get too few. Take them all inside your house. Close the door. Bring the boys in and start pouring and filling them up from that little jar of oil that you've got. And so she does what he tells her to do. They go in the house, she gets the sons, they start lining up the jars that they, get, that they borrowed. And she starts pouring. And she fills each one up, one after another after another, until she runs out. And it's amazing. It's an incredible miracle. And it, it reminds us actually of one of Elijah's miracles. If you remember with the, the, uh, the widow of, of Zarephath, she had but a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil, and he was hungry, and he says, make me, make me some bread, make me a cake to eat. And she says, I don't, I don't have enough. And he says, just trust me, make one. And so she makes bread, and there's enough for him, and enough for her son, and enough for her. And she does this every day throughout the drought, and that's how they survive, because of Elijah's miracle. But in this case, it's not just enough to survive, but it's more oil than this woman and her sons could ever consume right? It's, it's a lot of oil. 
So she goes, she tells Elisha about the miracle, and he says, great, sell it. Sell it all. Pay off your debts. The rest of it is your nest egg. Live off of that. You're set. So a couple observations about this miracle. First, it requires a certain act of faith on behalf of the woman, right? She has to go to the trouble of collecting the jars from her neighbors. And then she has to go inside and she has to keep on pouring. Do you wonder if she was thinking, what if I had gone to one more house, right? I'm not sure she realized that the excess was gonna end up being <laughs> money in her pocket. <laughs> if there was that one last house, what ooh, if I'd had a couple of more jars? Because you have to realize olive oil is a pretty valuable commodity. It'd be worth a lot of money. Second, Elisha doesn't actually seem to do anything more than give instructions in this miracle. The flow of oil clearly comes from the Lord, right? He's the one at work providing for the needs of this widow and her sons. That's not to say that Elijah is irrelevant. These sorts of things just don't really seem to happen when Elisha is not around. But there can be no doubt of the Lord's activity and involvement in this. Third, the miracle itself actually involves the widow herself. It involves her resources. Elisha doesn't just simply hand her money or even the oil itself. This oil comes from her jar. The Lord has looked upon her and found something that is redeemable, something useful, something of value, something that she doesn't likely even believe that she has herself. Now to be sure, she is in no way, and her jar of oil is in no way sufficient to meet the need or the problem she faces. Right? It's not that she's special, it's that she's special to God. It's just one little jar of oil. There's nothing bootstraps about any of this. But imagine how worthless and vulnerable she must have felt in her need and in her desperation. I mean, the only thing that she seems to have going for herself is enough chutzpah to go demanding help from Elisha. And even that is just born out of desperation. But the Lord multiplies that little bit of oil she has into a full provision for her. And think about the behind doors part. This gift is from the Lord, but it is her oil that she sells. No one in town can really question where this came from or how she got it, where she's the rightful owner or not. I mean, she borrowed the jars, but they were empty when she got them and they're not worth a whole lot. And nobody gave her the oil. Clearly, whether, whether the people around her could perceive this miracle or not, this is a woman who, from outward appearances, seems to have some degree of resource. What level of respect must she have gained in this town? Right? She goes from a weak and exposed widow to a woman of some ability. How must this have helped to restore some of the dignity that she felt like she lost in her moment of vulnerability? She has been redeemed by this miracle, given value, given esteem. It's more than just provision for her need. And friends, this is a picture of the gospel. How are you lacking? Do you realize that God finds something in you, even in the midst of your lack and your failure, something that he sees that is, that is beautiful because you're made in his image, something that he wants to redeem? Jesus died to save you because of something God sees in you. He doesn't wish you were someone else he just wants you to be his so that he can make something beautiful out of your lacking. You know, debts are a common metaphor for sins in the Bible. 
Occasionally I'm asked about the Lord's Prayer. You know, there's sort of two translations, two versions out there. Forgive us our trespasses, for we forgive those who trespass against us, or forgive us our debtors, our debts as we forgive our debtors. Which one is better, Pastor? Well, so literally, it's debts and debtors. But of course, those refer to our sins and our trespasses. Friends, Christ died to make up for everything that is lacking and insufficient in you and in me, right? To heal all of our brokenness. And he did it because he loves you. Your needs, your debts, your lacking, in spite of and even because of those things, God sees something in you worth healing, worth fixing. And he sent his son to take on all of our brokenness and to die for us and make us whole. Lastly, this miracle, as amazing it is, it is, is, is fundamentally very practical and redemptive. Now we throw that term redeem around a lot in church sometimes. Have you ever thought about what it means to redeem? To redeem something or someone is, and this is just a good old dictionary definition here, to compensate for the faults or bad aspects of something, which is to say to make up what is lacking, or to gain or regain possession of something in exchange for payment, that is to buy back something. So for example, we talk about redeeming a coupon. Right? If you redeem a coupon, you present it with your purchase to the seller and he is buying it back from you by discounting the product. The coupon isn't, isn't worth anything in and of itself until it's redeemed by the seller of the product. So when God redeems us, he pays for our sins with the blood of Christ, right? As Paul tells us, the wages of sin, the results of sin, the cost of sin is death, right? Jesus had no sins. We have plenty of sins. Jesus dies anyway, so his death can pay for our sins. That's how God redeems us or buys us back. But Elisha's miracle is redemptive on behalf of the widow as well. It doesn't pay for her sins, but it does pay for her debts, which are very real and could cost her and her sons her home and maybe, maybe even her life. So the miracle isn't about ultimate redemption, but it is a picture of that and a very real one for her because what it does is it fights back the results of sin, the consequences of sin in this broken world. As a church, as the people of God, as people that know that we have been redeemed by Christ's blood, we too have an opportunity to perform redemptive acts on behalf of the people that are around us. We aren't saving them from their sins when we do that, but we are helping to save them from the devastating effects of sin in the world in smaller ways. And we don't have to perform miracles in order to do that. We just need to apply the resources that God has given us to the needs that are around us. This is how we love our neighbors. We look around to find people in need and we help them. We give generously. Right, this is one of the reasons that we partner with New Hope High School. We're about to take up uh, a, a gathering of food uh, in, a, in a few minutes here for New Hope. There's a, we've, given, uh, we've, we've bought refrigerators for them. We've done any number of things in the past. Right, the kids at New Hope High School are on the fringe because of difficult situations that they find themselves in in their lives. Right? Regular high school hasn't worked out for them. They're in danger of, of failing to graduate. And they're about to get lost from regular society. But they're still image bearers of God and they have potential. They just need someone to help make up for what is lacking for them in this broken world. And so that school and those teachers, 
They're doing just that, and we are coming alongside to help with various needs, to be a redemptive force in these kids' lives through food and, and through other things. The food pantry is a part of that. Right, these kids come to school, they don't have a cafeteria in their facility. It's kind of hard to focus and study with a growling stomach. We provide snacks and foods and things that can help them to get through the day. This is also why we're giving part of our church's resources and, and taking up an offering for Ukraine, specifically for the refugees that are evacuating into Slovakia. Right, it's a picture of the gospel to perform redemptive acts on behalf of others to help make up for the ravages of sin that are magnified most in war, even more than any other situation. These acts help people to regain some piece of value and esteem that they should have as image bearers of God in a world that is robbing them of that at every step. This is what the church is called to do and privileged to do. It's what followers of Christ do. So I encourage you not only to join us in these efforts, but to help us find new and broader ways to reach out to needs that are around us so that we can be a force for redemption, a picture of the grace of Christ in our community and in our world. I don't know if you follow or pay attention to the El Arroyo signs. Most of them are pretty funny. They had a really poignant one. I think it was yesterday, maybe the day before. It said this, you cannot do all the good the world needs, but the world needs all the good that you can do. I'm not sure that they understand how wise that actually is. The world needs all the good we can do because when we do it out of the grace of Christ that's shown to us, it becomes a picture of that to people that are hurting because of the brokenness of the effects of sin and the fall. And friends, this is the beauty of the gospel. So I ask you again, where is your own weakness and need? How have you received the grace of Christ in your life? How have you been redeemed by him? You know, one of my, uh, my favorite Christmas carols is one of the very hardest uh, to sing, but I love the lyrics to it. It's O Holy Night. Got some really high notes. A lot of range. It has this wonderful line in the midst of it. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. Has your soul felt its worth because of Christ? Do you know what it means to be treasured by God so much that he would give up his only son to pay your debts? How can you share that with others that are around you? If you know what it feels like to be loved and treasured by God, then how can you share that grace and generosity with others that are suffering in this broken world? Because sharing the love of the Christ is what the gospel is all about. It's not just what we receive, it's, it's how we experience it when we begin to share it with others. We receive grace and we give grace. And there is no greater hope in this broken world. Amen? Amen, let's pray. Father, we thank you that in the midst of our great need and suffering, you sent your son, and we thank you for his, for his sacrifice on our behalf. We thank you for your generosity, for your care, for our material needs and emotional needs, all, all, all of the things that we need. And we thank you that you've called us out of, as a community to care for the needs of each other and for those that are around us. Help us to grow in that grace, to experience the truth of your gospel and uh, to share it with those that are around us. Transform us by the Holy Spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let's stand now and in response to the preaching of God's word, confess our faith with ancient words, with the words of the Nicene Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, 
begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, whom all things were made. For us men, for our salvation, came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost, the Virgin Mary, and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended to heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge the quick and the dead. The kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, proceeds from the Father and the Son and who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the mission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.